Good morning, everybody. My name is Marianne Capehart. I work for the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension, Cochise County Water Rights Program. Our talk today is on the dangers of arbovirus for mosquitoes bred in standing or stored water. Um, I have a special interest in this topic because one of the things I do is encourage rain harvesting as a conservation tool, and I want to make sure people keep their tanks from becoming mosquito breeding grounds and, and stay safe from um, any of these viruses. Um, our speaker today is Don Gouch. Don is an entomologist and integrated pest management specialist. Uh, working on public health related pests and, and uh, integrated pest management in the built environment. Her work focuses on pest ecology and reduced hazard management of pests that negatively impact human health, addressing a wide spectrum of health related pests in homes, schools, and medical facilities. Thank you, Dr. Gouge, for being here and welcome. Without further ado, I introduce to you, Dawn. Okay, hopefully now you can, uh, you'll see what are a whole bunch of mosquitoes flying around um, in a very unpleasant fashion. Um, I'm going to turn off my video um, just because I have some some videos within my oh it stopped it stopped my actual video on the PowerPoint that's interesting okay well we'll see what happens <laughs> let's see what happens hopefully you can still see my actual screen oh there you go start again all right, so um, thanks ever so much for the opportunity to talk today. I thought this was a really pertinent topic to cover right after we'd just um, been through all of the Earth Day celebrations and realizations. And if any of you were a part of that last week, um, well done and, and we have lots to do. And both mosquitoes and water harvesting um, are both very relevant topics uh, moving forward. So thanks for giving me a chance to speak. My aim here today is to get you interested in learning more about mosquitoes, alert you to the risks that they pose and suggest ways that you can reduce your own personal risks whilst go and going about um, the important jobs that, that you all do. Um, I do also have an ulterior motive that I will mention right at the end of um, the slide set today. But any story about mosquitoes is very much um, a story about water. Mosquitoes are entirely dependent upon water for their very existence. Um, and today you'll hear me talk a lot about the way we have modified our living environment um, to give them, um, and particularly the problematic species, abundant opportunities to live uh, both with us and also live on us, which um, is never very pleasant. So first of all, a bit about mosquitoes themselves and hopefully a few interesting facts for you that will, will amaze you. They have been around for an awful long time. Quite literally, mosquitoes were feeding off animals as blood feeders um, in the Cretaceous, 140 to 65 million years ago. Uh, whether they actually fed on dinosaurs um, is, is, according to my paleontologist sister, highly unlikely because their hides were so very thick or feathered. And uh, so there's some significant doubt as to how much blood they took from dinosaurs, but there were plenty of other animals around for them to feed on. And you can see from the fossils that, well, actually, I think this, these are um, mosquitoes in amber, actually, rather than fossilized uh, rock um, samples, they look remarkably similar to the mosquitoes that we have today. 
they really have a very winning design and they sort of have stuck with it throughout the years. They have what defines a mosquito and makes a mosquito a mosquito rather than any other kind of fly. They have very slender wee bodies, very long legs, and they have this very typical long proboscis. Even the males have long mouth parts, although they are used for taking up nectar meals rather than blood. But they still, you can see a male on the left of the bottom, bottom left of the slide there. Um, and that's a female on the right with the very, very typical proboscis that is that piercing and sucking mouth parts that we're all familiar with. But other than the adults, the larvae and the pupae, um, which is a lot of the lifetime of a mosquito, are all aquatic. So these are true flies. They have two wings and their wings are covered in these interesting scales that you can see a picture of in the top right corner there. There's a bunch of different species worldwide, more than 3,500 species. In the US, we have about 176. In Arizona, we probably have more than the 40 that we have rec recorded, um, but very, very few that actually ever really bother us. Um, the three, they are subdivided into subfamilies, which I've listed out there in bold. There's really only three groups that actually um, are considered uh, to be health risks because they take blood meals um, and they have the ability to vector disease causing pathogens. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. There is a genus of, of uh, oh, actually there, there's one genus in one subfamily of mosquitoes um, that does not, the females do not take blood meals. And they are these huge mosquitoes. Um, they're a couple of almost two inches in length as adults. And you might be wondering, well, don't they need a bunch of protein to start generating eggs? Um, and you'd be right, but they don't get their protein as adults. They actually get their protein as larvae. And the humongous elephant of a mosquito larva there that you can see in the video is the Toxorynchites mosquito larvae. And they have actually been tested for years to see if there was any way we could use these wonderful creatures to uh, reduce the problematic species. And so you can see that they're not very active, but once they grab a hold of another mosquito larva, um, they pretty much don't let go. So they're voracious little things, but these creatures are very, very sensitive to all kinds of environmental pressures. And we just, they have never proven to be a biocontrol agent that we really could effectively deploy in the field to control problem mosquito larvae, unfortunately. Um, we do have them in the west of Arizona, I should add that. They're very, very rare. But if you ever find a really gigantic mosquito, uh, it's probably one of the toxorynchites. But not all mosquito looking or mosquito like creatures um, are actually mosquitoes, of course. We have a whole host of other insects that look fairly similar. Um, the most commonly mistaken that, that we get questions of or get samples sent in for identification are the chironomids, the non-biting midges. And you can see that by looking at the mouth parts there, you immediately know there's no way that that's a mosquito because they have these little curled up um, mouth parts. There's no way that they can actually uh, bite. So, and then there are biting midges and you can see a picture of that on the uh, bottom in the center there. And they don't look particularly mosquito-like, but they do bite. And if you just end up covered in bites, quite often we get calls, you know, we don't know where the mosquitoes are, but we're getting bitten by mosquitoes. Every now and then it's actually biting midges. There's Ceratopogonidae is the family name. And then there's the things that are just definitely not mosquitoes. Crane flies are really commonly thought of as these gigantic uh, mosquitoes and 
my uh, colleague and friend Xu Zhan Li, who is on our um, our uh, webinar today, uh, did a a special extension bulletin on crane flies because there was. Uh, quite a big crane fly year. Uh, Tucson had a lot of crane flies in 2020. So did the Phoenix metro area. And uh, uh, Xu Li is also known by Lucy. So Lucy um, put together some uh, information for people to try to calm down and allay some of the fears that the enormous population of gigantic crane flies was causing. But you again, you see those uh, mouth parts are clearly not sucking piercing and sucking mouth parts so here are the piercing and sucking mouth parts that we're all worried about of the species in arizona there's really only six in all in the more than 40 that tend to bother humans at all and only two of those species are active vectors of disease causing pathogens at least that's for right now we do have potential vectors that could vector some very nasty diseases and we'll talk a bit about that in a minute so let's take a look at how how all of that disease vectoring actually gets delivered to a human in in, in a bite you can see from the uh, video that the mouth parts there's this strange um section that gets folded that is a sheath that bends up as the proboscis is inserted into the skin now it's pretty complicated what's happening right here uh, mosquitoes choose their targets uh, through a combination of smell heat and visual cues the proboscis includes six different needles two of which are entirely used to saw through into the surface of the skin to move tissues out of the way and, and sort of splay out um, and one injects saliva into the host and the other is used for the uptake of the blood meal uh, and they do this by using two different pumps that are synchronized and located in the mosquito's own head so viruses if they're present are waiting in these salivary glands and they're injected into the host along with the saliva as the mosquito feeds. And that saliva is actually really complicated as a, as a compound of different chemicals and does some incredibly interesting things. But suffice to say, you don't feel them. The blood flows, it doesn't clot, um, but you are left with a pretty nasty itchy bump um, if you happen to be sensitive to um, some of the proteins that they inject. So the female mosquitoes can live um, over a month for in, in many instances for um, most species, but usually they don't. Usually they end up dying um, less time than that. Uh, they're quite often eaten by something or they are pretty delicate and so they can be injured pretty easily as well. The mosquitoes of greatest concern from for me as a public health entomologist are the two Culex species that are well established in Arizona as the key West Nile virus and St. Louis encephalitis virus vectors. So I'm pretty sure that probably absolutely everybody has heard of West Nile virus. Um, hopefully some of you have heard of St. Louis encephalitis virus. Um, but you might be surprised to find out that there's still quite a number of people in in the, in our state that really don't consider either disease to be terribly threatening or terribly likely to impact them and we do have some pretty astonishingly high populations of culex quinquefaciatus that's the one uh, that's the southern house mosquito and Culex tarsalis, that's the Western encephalitis mosquito, um, in most of our urbanized areas. So they really are something to, to be concerned about. Both of these mosquitoes feed very happily on birds, and that's why they are important vectors. We are not ideal hosts for West Nile virus or St. Louis encephalitis virus. 
the, both of these viruses do very, very well in birds. So the normal cycle is that they will be transferred from birds to, to other birds by the Culex mosquitoes. And we just are sort of collateral damage, so to speak. Every now and then, mosquitoes feed on us. There's just not a bird handy when they start to decide they get peckish. West Nile virus does actually make birds sick and kills quite a number of birds. Also makes horses sick as well as humans. So a few things about the two mosquitoes of concern. So the hus southern house mosquito can fly a few miles. So the reason why that's very important to us, even if we're just people who work outside, but especially if we're people who work outside with water, um, is that this mosquito loves high organic content water. And even if you are being bitten by them or maintain your own property or the area that you're responsible with, um, absolutely no opportunities for them to develop in the water on site, you could still be bitten by them um, from surrounding areas because they will actually travel a few miles, usually less than five. Um, and they bite as soon as the sun sets. So if you go out and you're not bothered, and then as soon as you see that sun setting, um, and then you start to notice mosquitoes, highly likely they are Culex quinquefaciatus, the southern house mosquito. So then the other mosquito is even more problematic because these will fly many miles. Um, they've actually clocked them um, and recorded them in uh, capture, release, recapture studies, uh, flying more than 10 miles from where they emerge. So that gives you very little chance of having any control um, of them uh, resolving the populations at the source. But uh, there are ways that you can protect yourself. This is also a night biting mosquito. So, um, West Nile virus is the leading vector arbovirus in the whole of the US. And it is our leading arbovirus in, in Arizona as well. In 2019, there were just over 900 West Nile cases in the whole of the US. That is very, very few. Normally, um, in normal years, there is several thousand. Um, and again, in 2020, we had even fewer. Possibly, um, this was because 2019 was a very dry year, 2020 was a very dry year, and mosquitoes are incredibly imp dependent on on the water on water to um, to exploit as a development site. So we've had two very low years. The previous year was pretty pretty high actually. So um, here's where Arizona is. Now usually when you see your state and it is all colored in in a really really dark color, that's a bad sign, right? Well your instincts would be right um, and unfortunately Arizona and California and sometimes Texas are usually in that top three um, states in the whole of the continental US um, for the number of West Nile cases each year. Now the slide that you're looking at here it, it references 174 West Nile clinical cases and 18 deaths. Um, we carry in Arizona a relatively high number of the more severe form of the West Nile in illness. Um, there's a number of reasons why we think that might be the case. About 80% of people who are infected with the West Nile virus have no symptoms at all. They don't even know that they have it. About 20%, a little less than 20%, develop a fever, uh, maybe headaches, body aches, joint pains. Uh, some people actually get sick to their stomach um, and a rash is, is um, present in some cases and not others. Less than 1% of infected people 
will develop a neuroinvasive form of the disease, which then comes with all of these very scary the symptoms like meningitis and encephalitis, acute flaccid paralysis. None of this is good. And many of these people are left with um, a, a constant problems for many years or indefinitely. And about 10% of the, the very severely ill neuroinvasive disease cases are actually fatal. So you can see Arizona is not faring well when it comes to the neuroinvasive disease. So this is um, sort of a different way of looking at a similar thing. This is the overall West Nile virus disease cases as um, per 100,000 of our population. And in short, just have a look at the solid blue line, which indicates the average incidence um, between the years 200 and, uh, 20, 20, uh, 2004 and 2018. And the dashed line shows um, the uh, case rate in 2019. So uh, you can see that some years are extremely high and some years are not. So uh, again, uh, definitely cause for concern in, our, in Arizona every single year. So another cause for concern, but not quite so significant, is the existence of the yellow fever mosquito, Aedes aegypti. Now, the yellow fever mosquito, you can see this uh, CDC map in the top right there. I was tempted to white out Arizona um, or change it a little bit um, because we have Aedes aegypti in lots and lots of places in the low desert. And you'll see a map of Arizona where we found this mosquito showing up at higher elevations, but it's not quite everywhere, um, in, not quite uh, right. Um, so our incidents don't reflect what you can see there at the CDC map. The reason why we're so concerned about this mosquito, it's an invasive species, of course, um, is it is extremely good at transmitting Zika viruses, dengue viruses, chikungunya viruses, and even yellow fever viruses. And these, of course, are primate viruses that are extraordinarily good at replicating in humans and making us pretty sick. Now, luckily, this mosquito is very sensitive to freezing. And so one of the reasons why we may not have endemic dengue in Arizona, one of several reasons, um, is possibly because we, we do have, we have had cold snaps during the winter where this mosquito is and hopefully it kills a whole load of the wee blood suckers over the winter. Um, warming winters are not a good thing. Of course, uh, warming winters will give this mosquito the potential to continue to replicate during winter months and then there may be no, no uh, one less barrier to uh, viruses um, that are have not been endemic in Arizona for many, many years, getting a hold and getting established in Arizona. Uh, dengue is endemic um, south of our border uh, in Mexico, Sonora, Mexico, and, um, and we do have border cases of dengue being transmitted um, pretty uh, regularly. So it is cause for concern. And this mosquito is literally a mosquito that's extraordinarily lazy. They do not want to fly very far. If you are being bitten by mosquitoes where you're standing, it's probably true to say that it, within a couple of hundred feet around you, um, they are emerging from water. So in this instance, you got a really good chance at reducing or completely eliminating these mosquitoes. These love cryptic habit habitats. They need teeny tiny amounts of water. Had a student in the lab um, doing a science fair project uh, who was um, 
monitoring how uh, the thickness or how narrow a, a water, how, how uh, little water she could get mosquitoes to emerge from. And she, it, she went down to two millimeters of water. And as long as she maintained the water film at two millimeters, she, so a, a good number of the adults were able to develop and emerge from just that thin layer of water. They are day biters. And they're super beautiful. You can see this black and white stripy um, mosquito. They, if they're hungry, they will chase you down the street. Um, they, they are pretty voracious feeders and um, they are looking for humans primarily. We do not have this um, Asian tiger mosquito uh, again, very beautiful mosquito to look at and to observe, but definitely not one that we want in Arizona. Again, the CDC map there shows this sort of swath across Arizona. We have lucked out so far. This mosquito has been introduced several times into Arizona, but each time there's been a concerted effort to eliminate it before it manages to take hold. But you can see that we are surrounded by um, states that have Aedes albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito. So um, if you find that you are observing mosquitoes that are black and white and super stripy and biting you during the day, please send them in for identification. We would be happy to take a look at them. Um, and we are constantly on the lookout for this one in particular because we definitely don't want it here. Um, and it is, as I've just said, pretty regularly established. Um, sorry, pretty regularly introduced, um, but has not been established. So what are the chances? Um, say. We know we have Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito. We know that we have travel cases of um, dengue where people acquire the virus somewhere else where it's endemic and then travel into Arizona. Uh, we know that we have travel cases of Zika and other um, viruses that cause illness. You know, what, what do we need in order for viruses of that kind to become established? This is just all you, all you need. You need um, a species that could vector the pathogens, um, a vector that's competent at transmitting the pathogen and carrying the virus and spreading it um, to feed on a susceptible host, that would be us, in a supportive environment. And we have, in many cases, the mosquito. We have the environment we are the hosts um, and so we really have to work pretty hard to make sure that those viruses are not um, introduced and, and don't don't manage to get in into an endemic um, circulation in Arizona. Um, we don't have any of these viruses circulating in Arizona but potentially we could um, another mosquito that people are sort of tend to be fairly surprised that we have is the Western malaria mosquito. And we do actually have um, about 2,000 cases of malaria in the US and a number in Arizona every single year. And there's in most parts of the US, you can see that there's a host that could potentially actually transmit and um, in sylvatic, in wildlife uh, species, some of them are transmitting um, malaria. Um, for humans, um, most of the malaria cases are uh, local infections somewhere else and the people travel into Arizona and then they're diagnosed. There is a condition called airport malaria where um, airports can be hubs for the release of all kinds of invasive species just because as we travel uh, mosquitoes and other insects get accidentally introduced there's congenital malaria and even cases of transfusion blood transfusion malaria so we um, do have uh, cases of malaria and and it is something that's uh, considered to be pretty 
pretty important. So um, these are not vectors, but these bite people um, in significant numbers at certain times. When we get really high numbers very early in the spring before the high temperatures start hitting, um, we, quite often it's Aedes vexans. Throughout the summer, um, particularly if we get lots of rain, we get these huge blooms of serophora emerging, which can, um, both of these bite during the day, and uh, both can cause nasty, irritating welts, uh, but neither of them transmit pathogens of any kind. So I want to give you um, a little bit of insight into the life cycle and so you can see where their vulnerabilities lie and you can see where their dependence of water comes and i think everybody's probably pretty familiar with the generalized life cycle everything other than the adult and adults mating on the wing occurs um, on or in or next to water so um, Let's have a quick look at what this this life cycle involves. We've got a yellow fever mosquito there emerging um, from water. Pretty remarkable photographs by Alex Wild, I should add, who's very generously allows us to use them. Um, there you can see where the mosquito has emerged and it has left its uh, cuticle under the water. They rest on the surface as their cuticle hardens and the wings all flatten out and harden and uh, then they're ready to fly. The males emerge first. Um, they don't seem to aspire too much, frankly. They'll take a nectar meal from a nectar source. They will mate multiple times over the next few days and then they die. And then the females, on the other hand, um, some will feed on nectar um, pretty readily off and on some hardly take any nectar at all depending on the species um, quite often they'll take nectar to begin with and then they'll start in on the blood meals and they never look back they mate only usually only once and the blood the protein from the blood meals is used for the development of eggs and quite often they'll have uh, multiple blood meals every several days and typically live between a week and a month. They can live longer but quite often um, they'll die, they'll be eaten or they die because of due to injury. So the mating of mosquitoes is quite a remarkable thing in of itself. Uh, many species mate in flight uh, using a process called lecking. Uh, the males emerge first like mentioned and they will gather over a particular point in the landscape. They'll use visual markers to group and form a swarm and they're literally waiting for the females to emerge and the males uh, find their ideal partners uh, using these huge fluffy antennae um, and they what they're doing is they're queuing in on the humming frequency of female wing beats and this is how each species finds their compatible mate um, on the wing. They'll literally um, tune in. Both, both sexes have these organs at the base of their antennae that um, are just packed full of thousands of sensory neurons. And they detect the tiniest air particles displaced by sound vibrations. Um, and they will so you know they don't have a dating app but they sing and when they form frequencies that for they will alter their wing speed so that they can generate harmonic frequencies and that is how they find one another pretty remarkable i think that's quite romantic so um okay so as a result of you know a brief but meaningful courtship perhaps the female can then start the business of blood feeding and laying eggs and you can see um, a southern house mosquito there has laid on the surface of water this beautiful 
slew of very carefully deposited um, eggs and she'll lay around 40 to 50 quite typically. And these rafts float on the surface and they darken pretty quickly. And once they are have darkened, uh, they're really difficult to see on the surface of water. So you might think that there's nothing there um, and, and, and you might be surprised sometimes. So other species do things a little differently. The uh, picture on the bottom left is the yellow fever mosquito and they will lay eggs singly and they will put them on the surface or on the edge close to surface of water so that as the water level rises they are flooded with water and then they hatch very very quickly. Um, sometimes they deposit it on the surface. The picture on the top right there, those are Anopheles eggs and you can see these little silver um, floaties that each egg has. Those are literally flotation devices that keep those eggs at the surface of the water no matter what the level of the water is over time. In the case of yellow fever mosquitoes, this is what the eggs look like. So this is a white pot put outside with just total water in it, nothing else, and a wooden stick. And the, the eggs that are laid, um, some hatch literally within minutes. If you ever get a chance to do this, have an entomologist bring some, some eggs so that you can see this for yourself under a microscope in a Petri dish. It is utterly mind-blowing. You can add a drop of water and the eggs literally start hatching in front of your eyes within minutes. Teeny tiny weeny little larvae. They're pretty cute at that stage. Um, not all of the eggs hatch right away. Some don't hatch, um, but will hatch later in time. They are um, filter feeders as larvae and they're consuming microbes and they use these interesting siphon tubes which are literally an extension of the posterior spiracles um, and they'll stick these siphon tubes up through the surface of the water um, and that's how they accomplish their their gas exchange so you can see a bunch of larvae here with cute little faces filtering away and uh, it looked like somebody was coming in there to join them. There you go. Uh, quite often they're a little more active like that. They look more like this than, than what you saw before. Now this is in crystal clear water, of course, just so that we could actually see this. Um, different species have different sort of ways of moving. And so if you get an entomologist to point into uh, at some larvae, sometimes um, if they're very familiar, that's a pupa that you can see, that the big round head that just came in and out. And there di is actually different kinds of, of larvae in there, but they move differently. So here's the pupae, wild looking things. Um, they move, they are pupating, so they are changing into adults quite dramatically in there. They have to, to um, they, they don't feed, but they still have to go to the surface to, for their gas exchange. Um, mosquitoes overwinter in different, different species overwinter in different stages. Uh, of course, usually the most concerning of, are the Culex. Um, Culex mated females can find you know protected harborage places and uh, will overwinter in in just a, a a diapause state where they're not feeding of course but those are already carrying potentially a virus that they can already infect um, people with uh, at the beginning of the following year so hopefully you can see um so we're with an insect so inherently dependent upon water to develop in, uh, reducing mosquito related risks to human health is going to involve very careful water management. And I feel kind of like a bit of an idiot really, because I've been doing this job for over 20 years and 
I just recently got on a website, in fact, for putting this presentation together for today, and I found this wonderful list of uh, water saving. This is a water saving list from a water conservation site. Now, I know that everybody here is really familiar with this list, but I wasn't. And it occurred to me that all of the text that has changed color these are all things that we as public health entomologists ask uh, residents to do. And we should probably be asking them to do the other things that we haven't been. <laughs> um, also, also, as not only for water conservation, but uh, to manage mosquitoes. So um, I'm very keen to learn more. Put it that way. So I bet this is something that you love to see. Maybe some of you have this at home or at work or both. Um, so what do you think I think of this? This is sort of, this is what I think of this, right? So hopefully you understand that. Um, from my perspective, fitting a mesh screen over the top of water collecting barrels in particular would be the simplest thing to do. Um, it would exclude mosquitoes that needed to go down to the water to lay eggs, those that any eggs that ended up being deposited over the water, sometimes that happens, the mosquitoes would be limited as to their ability to fly out. These mesh screens look the same to me, but they're not. It's only the 18 by 18 mesh screen that has the gaps small enough to exclude mosquitoes. So that's the first thing, super simple exclusion measures. But I don't know if that will actually work for water harvesting systems. I really don't, genuinely don't know. But if it, if it works in some instances, great. If it doesn't, there are other alternatives. Um, one of which is the use of gambusia. It might feel strange that you think about putting these cute little fish in your rain barrels, but they are remarkable little um, creatures. They are omnivores. They will eat uh, organic matter. They will eat each other. So if you have uh, rain harvesting systems that cannot tolerate uh, it just wouldn't work with a mesh screen over the top. Um, there are other things that gambusia, as long as your water will never, uh, does not have the potential of overflowing into a natural waterway, gambusia are great. If you do have water collection areas and storage areas that could overflow into natural waterways, gambusia are not an, a fish that should end up in natural waterways. We're really trying to avoid that. Um, similarly, uh, keeping gutters and drainage conduits that drain into harvesting areas clear from debris and unclogged sounds really simple. It really is. And you can put just mesh that will exclude leaf litter and debris, the usual debris um, to get that working. Um, reducing opportunities, uh, looking at this murky water. Um, this is Southern House Mosquito Haven. So you have an unmanaged pool on the right and a water storage area on the left. Uh, if you can put fish in that, fantastic. Um, if not, there are other things, but also thing we have lots and lots of opportunities, but anything that's murky has that high organic matter. That is the worst kind of water to not manage for mosquitoes because those are the locations that the Culex viral vectors do favor. It's not always obvious if they have mosquitoes in. Uh, you don't have to have one of these fancy mosquito dippers. Anything that's white, a white cup, a white pan, um, you can stick in. But sometimes you really have to take a scoop out before you, under you can have a hope at realizing whether there's mosquito larvae in there. This is one of my pet peeves, um, neighborhood retention areas. A lot of our neighborhoods are organized so that all of the stormwater um, collects on sort of within the neighborhood. 
and you've got uh, two dry, dry wells on the left, one that is full of soil and debris and totally clogged and not draining anywhere. And the one in the bottom, that is not a dry well. It's irrigated multiple times a day. That is insanely bad planning. Let's just put it like that. Um, and then on the right, we have a neighborhood where the storm system, drainage system is so clogged full of rubbish and debris that there's uh, their dry wells are totally backed up. And hopefully you can see from the right that this one in particular was full of yellow fever mosquitoes. They don't usually favor these situations, but when they do, they can generate thousands and thousands of mosquitoes. It can be unbearable. It's pretty much like that picture in the top right. So you look at these beautiful suburban neighborhoods and you think, gosh, how can there be mosquitoes? They're so you know highly manicured. There's lots and lots of development site opportunities in these neighborhoods. Uh, and mosquitoes don't care whether it's irrigation or rainwater. They're up for anything. So I'm going to give you a few examples. Yellow fever mosquitoes are um, in African countries where they were um, originated, were mostly developing in rock pools, leaf axles, and tree holes. They're, they're one of the tree hole mosquito group. With us, they mostly use our stuff that holds water. And so we provide them, even if we're not aware of it, with lots of different opportunities. So if you have a pool and you have one of these lovely water features, that has a water vault underneath the, usually behind the waterfall where, where you can see on the top right there, top left, sorry. Um, and you can see students pulling out water samples. The waterfall in this, in the pool that they were sampling from just hadn't been run. And if you don't run it every week, that water in there, the chlorine will, um, will uh, vaporize very quickly in a matter of days and it's not circulated and they will breed mosquitoes. Um, and all of the other things that you can see here uh, tires are particularly problematic. Um, if you can't move them in a timely manner, drill holes in them and uh, just, or anything, uh, furniture for that matter, drill holes in it so that they dry. Really awful water features. Uh, I'm not a fan. I know they can be lovely and sound lovely, but they can generate hellacious amounts of mosquitoes if they're not um, maintained. And that means chlorinating them, I'm afraid. And a lot of people don't want to do that. And I completely understand, particularly if it's a bird bath and you're hoping that to help the birds out, they just need to be looked after very, very carefully. You can put gambusia, the little mosquito eating fish, in bird baths or water fountains um, that will help a lot. And then there's the indoor outdoor opportunities, everything from pet bowls to vases. We had a, a hospital situation where mo mosquitoes were biting very sick people in hospital. And it was the yellow fever mosquito jumping from, it must have come in in a vase um, or something or got in somehow on a person. And then they were, uh, we actually found larvae in multiple vases in uh, the one order. Um, condensate pans that are holding water and even um, toilets if they're not flushed constantly. So, you know, there's there's predators like gambusia and the copepods that you can use. There are a bunch of microbial products that you could use that will um, kill the larvae. They eat them and die. Um, and then there are monomolecular films that are wonderful tools. No good if you um, may or may not work for water harvesting. It, I, I need help from you all um, letting me know what really what, what is likely to work. Uh, there are insect growth regulator products and Spinosad is um, a product that's also available. For pupae, monomolecular films, remember they're not 
uh, feeding, so you have to pretty much suffocate them. There are some natural predators. Um, and then there are some traps that you can use as well. And they are usually mosquito specific, which species specific. There are sugar baits available that you spray on plants and the idea is the mosquitoes go and they feed on, th they're looking for nectar and take a sugar meal and die. They haven't proven to be very convincing for me. Um, there are lots of other products that you can use, but I don't usually recommend them for residential use. There are pyrethroids and organophosphates and dual action adulticides and um, also organophosphate uh, larvicides, but I really, uh, I prefer those to be in the hands of professionals and only when absolutely necessary. Predators, anything that supports diversity in a garden is going to be inherently beneficial um, for building um, a healthy amount of predators and that it all helps to reduce mosquito numbers. And then this, if, if you do nothing, nothing else, please consider uh, using your own personal protection when you're working outside. Loose clothing is wonderful if it's covering arms and legs. When Lucy and I um, and our other um, uh, group, uh, members of the group go out to do mosquito work, we are swathed from head to toe. We, you cannot see uh, and anything other and, and with the mask wearing last year, our field season, there was absolute and sunglasses, there was a nose is pretty much what you could see of us. We cover up and, and for us, it's, it's the best way to go. There is clothing treated repellent and then there's repellent that you only use on clothing. Don't ever put permethrin on your skin. And there's clip-ons and then we, I listed here the um, active ingredients that have proven, scientifically proven, to be very, very effective. So look at your repellent and make sure you have something with one of those in it. I'm going to wrap up with a few words on climate change impacts and, and mosquitoes. Um, Tucson and Phoenix are listed in the top four fastest warming cities. Last year, the city of Phoenix set 33 record high temperatures, all this in an incredibly dry year. And a collaborative U of A and Department of Health Services citizen science project led by Kathleen Walker from the Department of Entomology confirmed yellow fever mosquitoes to be established in more locations than we'd ever found them before and they'd ever been reported and at much higher elevations in beautiful cities where tourists are, imp are an important part of the income for the area and we hadn't they hadn't been established previously. Um, in places where humans provide water in abundance, medically significant mosquitoes are anticipated and expected to pose an increasing threat to human health in our state for the foreseeable future. So I'm looking for ways to weave mosquito management tactics into any water management initiatives that Extension already has established or outside of Extension for that matter. Um, and I thank you for the opportunity of talking today. And if you have any ideas for me, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dawn. That was fascinating. Wow. I'm, I'm in awe of the, of the mosquito, for better or worse. Um, right. And um, yes, I would love to assist with any um, advice I can give. I mean, for rain harvesting, you generally want that 18 uh, screen on the input of the water and the overflow of the water. It generally does a pretty good job, a very good job. If, if it's nice and secure of keeping them out of stored water, it seems like the standing water is more of an issue. Um, that I had actually 
a friend came over and helped put up gutters for a second rain harvesting tank, and we were inundated with mosquitoes. And it turned out that it was like a nightmare day. Um, we finished it somehow, but it turned out that our neighbor had these vases which she was planting in, and there was enough gravel in them that they were breeding in there and just flying everywhere. It was just a, a really crazy phenomenon. It, it took us forever to figure out where are they breeding. And it was these sort of, you know, elaborate sort of Grecian vases. Um, now for, for the question we had on the chat um, from Robert, um, you wanna take that? I mean, I know that rain barrels for irrigation are fine with dunks um, that I don't recommend it if you're using it for potable supply. Okay. And you wanted to add something to that, Don? Um, I don't see the question. I'm sorry. I am, I've got the chat it's, open. but um, It says floating mosquito dunks in rain barrels, question mark from Robert. If he wants to unmute, he could ask as well. So, yes, um, sometimes it's that simple. Um, mosquito dunks do very well uh, as long as the, um, you know, they, they'll the last for several days sometimes uh, as long as you're monitoring those those barrels and as soon as you see those wriggling larvae chuck in a mosquito dunk it sometimes it's really that simple unless there's issues that you have from the the rain the the water use side of things um most of the mosquito dunks that use the bt they um you can put fish in there as well uh, horses can drink from uh, water holding containers that um, that have either fish or the mosquito dunks in. I don't recommend putting mosquito dunks in um, uh, pet bowls and such like that, but if it's just the occasional bird that's going to swoop in and get it, mosquito dunks don't do them any harm at all. The toxins are, are a problem for insects in the gut. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, there's a Aedes aegypti was on the news this morning. Oh my goodness. They are releasing genetically altered males in Florida. Yes. So I believe that they are most, I think they are the Oxitec um, yellow fever mosquitoes. Uh, we, I have, I've been fascinated by this. So they are genetically altered um, in a way that uh, it, they cannot produce viable offspring. So the mosquitoes that they release are all male. They mate with the, f the wild females and the females lay eggs and they're not viable. And so, um, you know, there's no genetic material that continues on in any way. And uh, it's proven to be really effective in certain areas. And I think it's like the second year or the third year even where they've done studies in Florida on um, yellow fever mosquito. But yeah, it's really interesting. Fighting fires in Alaska, do the billions of mosquitoes up there carry any diseases? Good question. I'm, I don't know. I would have to check that out. If you wouldn't mind sending me an email, I will find out and I'll let you know. I don't believe that Alaska is anywhere near the top in the swath of human diseases that we monitor. Um, but whether there is any, um, hmm. I'm going to check up on that. Thank you for the question. Would we send you mosquitoes for your analysis? So if you are absolutely, so we are really interested in knowing what is where in general. And if it is biting humans, we're very much interested. So if you do want to send us anything, just make sure that it's nothing that uh, in a container that won't get crushed in the mail. And um, I'm not sure. Um, Marianne, is there a way? I'll, I'll, uh, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Lee if she would mind putting our address in the chat for everybody. And uh, 
I can see that she's still on. So hopefully she'll type that in there for you. Mail us uh, what you found. And we, as long as it arrives in pretty good condition, we will let you know. And Marianne, that's just your message to asking people to fill out the survey? Yes, that is. So. Okay. And if anybody to... has any other questions mm -hmm. that they'd rather just email me, please feel free, everybody. Do you want me to type in the address right now? Sure. Okay. Oh, you can type it in. <laughs> makes no <laughs> <more> sense. <laughs> I can do it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, here we go. We've got it. Thank you, Lucy. Oh, we've got it. Oh, thanks. Thank you, Lucy. Awesome. Wow, that was wonderful. I'm so glad we recorded that. And tell your friends that it will be up on the Waterwise YouTube site um, soon. And um, we can watch it again or let friends know, <laughs> especially, especially as water harvesters or people who enjoy water features. Um, that part was very interesting to me. I'm going to really think hard and long about the different types of water features that I see around that, that people are using. Um, and not get scared about the disease. We'll just do our best to <laughs> um, prevent. So um, wonderful. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, Thank you. And I guess with that, we will let everybody get back to their day and must get final comments. All right. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. Thank you. Have a great Bye. day.